Um, this uh, section continues with what we looked at last time, the very core teaching in Peter's letter from chapter 2 verse 11 up to and into chapter 4 is uh, the same theme of um, God's people being called to do good to those who do bad towards us. Um, and I mean, I suppose it sounds kind of cynical, but that means there's lots of opportunities for us to do good um, because uh, we live in a world uh, that is evil. And as we will see, we are part of that evil and God has done good to us. Now I'm going to pick up on what we do- looked at last time because I want you to see that the principle uh, in verse 11 and 12 of chapter 2 still applies. This is the, verse 11 and 12 is kind of the interpretive key to the rest of this middle section of Peter. So let me remind you again of the principle in verse 11 and 12 of chapter 2. Dear friends, Peter says, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives amongst the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. That's the principle. That's the principle that we are called to live by uh, for those of us that have come to faith in Christ, who God has rescued and saved and brought to himself uh, as we saw in chapter 1, given us this glorious inheritance, chapter 2 made us a kingdom um, of royal priests to serve God and proclaim his praises. How do we live in this world as foreigners and exiles, as those um, who are citizens of the kingdom in the land of the emperor? Uh, live such good, uh, abstain from sin, live such good lives amongst the unbelievers. Why? So that they will see you doing good and glorify God. How will they glorify God? Either because uh, their accusations are not founded and their condemnation is to God's glory or their conversion because they see your good deeds will be to God's glory. Your behavior will affect, will, will, will bring justice or, or salvation either way. We saw this applied last time to those um, uh, relationships uh, in the world where there is potential for injustice or unfairness. We saw it applied to the government in verse 13 to 17 of chapter 2. Even this pagan um, anti-Christian Roman Empire, even a secular government, um, uh, we're called uh, to submit to them in the fear of the Lord. Uh, We saw this applied to masters in verse 18 to 25 of um, chapter 2. A great number, um, one third a lot of historians say, Um, of people in the Roman Empire were slaves. So many lived in an unjust or unfair uh, work relationship. Um, And of course we we saw this applied to husbands as wives are called uh, to submit even to the unbelieving husband with the hope of winning them over by uh, the conduct of their lives. So these potentially unjust relationships are the outworking of the, of the principle of verse 11 and 12 of chapter 2, to live godly lives in the face of ungodliness so that people may be one to God through faith in Jesus, or at least be vindica- or you be vindicated on the last day. And lastly, as Peter wraps up this instruction with its various applications, uh, the last practice that he calls us to do as a kind of a wrapper really relates to Um, how we live with each other as believers, and more broadly, how we live as believers in society around us, which which does not believe in Jesus and is even potentially hostile to Jesus. So look secondly at our practice there that Peter calls us to live by uh, in verse 8 of chapter 3. Finally, all of you, he says, um, uh, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. You'll notice that there are five, there's five uh, positive instructions there for God's people uh, with this principle of godly conduct in mind. In that one verse is packed five instructions for us. It's got a similar echo to Paul's words about the fruits of the Spirit. It's a similar picture. If the Holy Spirit at work in your life, the outworking of that is going to be this uh, harmony, uh, live in harmony with one another, or be like-minded. This, um, uh, this uh, unity that God's people have, that we, we, um, we work together, we, uh, we are of the mind of the Spirit, as Paul 
would say. We must seek that. Um, be sympathetic. Um, uh, the original word really means um, um, empathy with someone who is suffering. Um, but not just not South African empathy. You know, South African empathy is South African empathy is like for whales at the moment. Ah, oh, shame. You know, that's that's South African empathy. Ah, oh, shame. And then we just keep going. Um, that's not how Christians should be. Uh, uh, sympathy is that coming alongside somebody with empathy in their suffering. Love one another, Philadelphia, brotherly love. That's a mark of God's family of believers. Compassion, be compassionate, that's care for the poor, care for those who are hurting, and it actually does show. Um, one of the things that has come up quite a lot in, in um, our society is compassion fatigue. People have got compassion fatigue because everyone's in a crisis and there's no one left to care because everyone's falling apart. Uh, compassion fatigue uh, is a, one of the buzzwords at the moment. That God's people are called to be compassionate. And, and one of the ways in which you can overcome compassion fatigue, by the way, is to stop scrolling. Because the world will just flood you with disaster after disaster. You know, I mean, I was reading just yesterday that a man got knocked off his bicycle and died in Papua New Guinea. Now, I'm heartbroken for the guy, but really, I need to narrow my focus. Otherwise, I'm going to have compassion fatigue. <laughs> Are you with me? So stop scrolling, pay attention to the people around you, and you'll have some energy left. Otherwise you're just taking on everything and it's just going to crush you before you even get out of bed in the morning. God's people show compassion to their circle and learn not to take on everyone else. Trust the Lord to put people in place to care for the family of the cyclist in Papua New Guinea. Uh, and you take care of the people here uh, in Medaric and Bergfleet. Uh, and then be humble or humility, which many people say is the lost virtue of the Christian church in the 21st century. Uh, arrogance has almost become a virtue, um, uh, bolshiness. We've seen so many spectacular crashes of Christian leaders in the last few months around the world um, because of their pride and arrogance. Um, and the, another problem with the online world is you c your godliness can be hidden or your character can be hidden and you can just display some spectacular oratory ability but no one knows your character um, and you will crash. Um, <clears throat> harmony, sympathy, uh, brotherly love or loving one another, compassion, humility, those are the signs of God's family in how they relate. To one another. So should be the mark of believers uh, when they um, gather with one another and live and do life together. That's how we should live towards one another. And then more, uh, in more detail, Peter unpacks how we should live towards society around us from verse 9. And again, it fits with the overarching principle um, of verse 11 and 12 of chapter 2, verse 9. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this you were called, so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil, their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. It's an extensive quote from Psalm 34. The more I read Peter's letter, the more I think Peter might have had his quiet time in Psalm 34 when he wrote this letter. Uh, there's little hints of Psalm 34 um, throughout this letter, and Isaiah, obviously, but everyone quotes from Isaiah in the New Testament. Um, and you see it in chapter 2, verse 3, where he says, you know, now that you've tasted that the Lord is good, that's also Psalm 34. And there's a ring of Psalm 34 throughout um, Particularly uh, the understanding of the God who rescues those, um, his people from the unjust, which is very much the theme of Psalm 34. This poor man called and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. So how do we um, live towards the world around us, as particular those who treat us badly or with evil intent? Um, 
Um, do not repay evil with evil, but repay evil with blessing, because to this you were called, so that you may inherit a blessing, verse 9 says. Uh, uh, it's interesting how Peter touches on this blessing aspect quite a bit here, and there is some deep Old Testament understanding with this word going all the way back to Abraham and God's promise to God's people that um, he would bless the descendants of Abraham. And um, that blessing uh, promise runs all through the scriptures and it's behind Peter's thinking here. Um, especially how he says you may inherit a blessing because the inherited blessing comes to those who are of the faith of Abraham. We come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the blessing is really the reversal of the curse on our world, the curse of sin. Um, and the, those who come to faith in Christ are blessed in that way. It's not just a when you sneeze, we say bless you. We're really saying reverse the curse of the COVID that you've just sneezed on me. Um, reverse the curse of sin, of course. Um, and there's a, so there's a depth to this word blessing. It's not just saying bless you. Uh, there's a theological depth here that's in Peter's mind. And part of you behaving in a godly way to the ungodly is a, is a way in which you're blessing them, hopefully with the blessing of the curse being reversed on their life as they come to faith in Jesus. Now, that sounds great to do on paper. But it's not that easy to do in practice, particularly in our world where the mood is not very strong on kindness. People seem to be very strong on anger. Everybody's angry. We're under such a lot of pressure and stress. Um, and even amongst Christians, I've discovered that you know, people are more bent on revenge than reconciliation. And um, that's, very, that's completely contrary to the gospel. We are called to be counterintuitive here. We are called to be counterintuitive when it comes to this. It's a hard task because our sinful intuitive nature wants to react with anger or revenge to those who hurt us and do wrong to us. And actually we're called to do the opposite. I have to come back to this again and again because my instant reaction often is to be angry about something. And God's Holy Spirit calls us by, by His Word to be counterintuitive here and to bless those who hurt us. Um, and it doesn't feel like it's right. Uh, but God's kindness to us also isn't right. We're called to be counterintuitive here and to do good even when uh, bad is done to us. And he encourages us to do that, verse 13. Who's going to harm you if you're eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you're blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. There's that blessed word again. Why are you blessed? You're going to heaven. The curse has been reversed for you. You're blessed. And it doesn't matter how much cursing you get in this world, it cannot take away the blessing. The blessing of eternal life that you have when you're of the faith of Abraham. When you've come to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is how we will equip ourselves for godly suffering by holding to Christ. This is very much the key instruction here, verse 15. But in your hearts set apart or revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Set apart in your hearts Christ as Lord. Let me just say that Peter is not saying, as I once heard a minister say at a wedding to the bridal couple, keep in a quiet little corner of your hearts for Jesus. He's not saying that. This is not some sentimentality. And it's not some uh, kind of keep your religion private, which is the secular code of the day. Just keep your religion in your heart, but not in your mouth or in your life. Just keep a quiet little corner of your life for Jesus. That's not what it's saying. Uh, in that ancient world, the understanding of the heart is, um, is the understanding of the heart is the control room. The control room. The seat of your thought which affects your behavior. Remember, Jesus said, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. If Jesus is Lord in your heart, it will show in your life. That's what he's saying here. He's not saying keep your religion private. 
He's saying that if Jesus is Lord in your heart, that's at the center, the control room of your life. And it will show therefore in how you live, in how you speak, in how you behave. And being prepared should therefore follow the Lordship of Jesus Christ in your heart. To trust Jesus as Lord means you come to know him as Lord and are able to ex explain that to others. Um, be prepared. That means doing some work and preparing and knowing what you're going to say when the opportunity comes. That's real witnessing. When people see your life and they say, what is so different about you? You know what to say. I was quite surprised when I went to Bible college that um, when we did the survey of the students in the first year, almost none of us could actually articulate the gospel in a gospel presentation. Couldn't put it into a simple explanation to someone else who asks you. Now, if that's the struggle for prospective ministry students in first year Bible college, uh, I wonder if you identify with that. I hope you can at least share your testimony, that you, how you came to know Jesus. That's important. But if you're not sure how to explain the gospel to someone, that you should do something about that. Um, at our church in here, we ran it almost on a yearly basis. Simple, um, few weeks um, equipping in how you can actually communicate the gospel to someone. Um, and it's, it seems to be a kind of a lost practice, but actually it's essential. And we're encouraged to do it. Do you know how to explain the gospel to someone um, in, a, in a way that you won't be flustered and you can keep the main points? It's something um, uh, to bear in mind. When your pastor comes, say, we want to learn how to share the gospel with others if you don't know it. Um, share your testimony first of all. Share a basic gospel presentation. And the opportunities will come because people will see how you live and behave um, and you interact with people. It is our, uh, it is invaluable in this day and age where everybody talks and nobody does. And opportunities will come when people see your life is different. Um, uh, and even if people don't see that, verse 16, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. It's better to suffer. Uh, it's better if it's God's will to suffer for doing good than doing evil. This comes up again and again in Peter's thinking. Do what is, doing what is right, even when people accuse you of being wrong, it's good for your conscience now. It's good for your vindication future and for others' salvation. It does mean in many cases you're going to be misunderstood, criticized, written off in this life. As I travel around, um, uh, I, I often meet people who's, who tell me that I've said some terrible things. And then I'm like, well, who told you this? Because I don't remember saying that. Often people just misunderstand you or you get misrepresented. You have to learn to live with that. You have to learn to live with that. Because the Lord knows. As my wife says, she's going to put on my gravestone. The Lord knows. And, um, and uh, it's a comfort to keep that in mind. She doesn't say that because people say, where's Glenn? And she says, the Lord knows. <laughs> it's because whatever people say about me, the Lord knows what is true. Oh, and also, whatever people say about me, it's not as bad as who I really am. <laughs> when you do this, you're following in the Lord's footsteps. Enduring unfairness, misunderstanding, ill treatment, injustice. You're following in the Lord's footsteps. Look thirdly and lastly at our example from verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. Here is the example. What other example could there be? Christ, the ultimate example of someone who suffered unjustly, the righteous one suffering for the unrighteous. Christ endured injustice for our sake. We endure injustice for the sake of winning others to Christ. What other? It's the very center of our gospel. What other way is there to live if we are following Christ and being Christ-like? 
It's enduring injustice, as he did for us. Uh, let me take a moment to mention what many scholars say is the most difficult uh, passage to understand in the New Testament. From verse 19, after being made alive, Jesus went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people ate, in all were saved through water, and this water symbolizes baptism, which now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. It gives you the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It, it saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand, with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. Now, basically what Peter is saying here is, I have no idea. I've looked at all the commentaries, I've looked at all the scholars, everybody seems to have a different opinion. Who are the spirits in prison who disobeyed long ago when Noah was building the ark? It could be that Jesus was preaching through Noah as he was building the ark and condemning the unrighteous who ridiculed him. It could be Jesus going to declare his victory to the demons um, after he uh, went to the cross. Um, we don't know, but we do know that it was a victory that was won at the cross. And we do know that that victory saves people, like Noah and his family, the eight of them, who were saved through the flood. Oh, it's also interesting that he says that symbolizes baptism, but the boat always stayed on top of the water, never went in. but. They were saved by baptism. And again, it's not the ceremony, not the removal of dirt, a pledge of a good conscience towards God. Are you saved by baptism? No, because verse, uh, the verse at the end of verse 21 says, it saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's where your salvation is. The baptism is a symbol. However you want to do it, the baptism is a symbol. It's the death and resurrection of Jesus that saves us. Don't miss, as we look at that little aside, the main thrust of what Peter is saying. If you're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you will seek to live by his example as the one who endured injustice for your sake. You endure it for the sake of winning others to Christ. And we are called to do that uh, as citizens uh, in a country that is potentially pagan, as workers <clears throat> in a potentially unjust situation, as wives, uh, living with uh, unbelieving husbands as a Christian living in a hostile, secular society. And the goal is always that people may be one to Christ or at the very least be ashamed of their slander, as verse 15 and 16 says. In your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. That means it'll show in your life. And then be prepared to give an answer for the hope that is in you with gentleness and respect. And in a world, as I said, with so much empty talk, the power of an authentically Christ-like life will speak volumes and may well be the reason why somebody comes to Christ, particularly in this world where the talk is cheap. Um, it's holiday, so it's maybe some people are away. It's just us. So I'll share you. I'll share something personal. Um, just between us and the four billion people on YouTube. <laughs> when I was in the army, I wasn't a Christian. I didn't grow up as a Christian, as you know, and um, anything but a Christian. And. Uh, I was in a little medical base, and there was about a dozen of us at this medical base. We were all youngsters, you know, 19, 20, 21. And, um, and we were a little bit wild and naughty. But one of the guys of the 12 was a Christian. One of them was a Christian. I, I can't even remember his name. It, it was a strange name. It, was, it sounded like Schlenter, which in Yiddish is like... Uh, I don't know, like a thief or something, you know? Anyway, he was a Christian. And um, you could tell he was a Christian because he was the only one who never swore. If anyone's been to the army, you all know this. 
And um, we got like a three hour pass once a week out of the base. And all of us would take the pass on a Friday night or Saturday night. So we could go into town on a Friday night, Saturday night, you know, for tea parties and things like that. <laughs> and um, Schlenter didn't. He would take his pass on a Sunday morning so that he could go to church. He would, he would take his three hours, he had valuable three hours to go to church. And um, of course we all thought he was weird. So how did we treat poor old godly Schlenter? How did we treat him? We were awful to him. We were awful to him. We ridiculed him, we joked with him, we always gave him the worst stuff to do. Um, and I wasn't very nice to him at all. I used to get so irritated with him because he was like such a nerd, you know? And um, always with his Bible. And, and what was worse was I was like his senior. I, had, I was like a corporal and he was just nobody. And we were really horrible to this guy. Anyway, one Saturday night, we went on our three hour pass, which turned out to about six or seven hours, you know how it goes. And um, a little bit too much tea. And um, they had to carry me back to the camp. They had to carry me back to the camp. I was that bad. And uh, put me in the bungalow. And I had to be on duty the next morning, seven o'clock, seven o'clock. And that was just no way because I'd only got to bed at six, you know. So there was just no way I was going to get up at seven o'clock. Anyway, the guys came to wake me up. Lions, lions, wake up, wake up, you're going. And you're in trouble if you're not on duty. It's an essential service at the base. You're in big trouble. You're going to be in DB. And um, I just couldn't, I, I couldn't get out of it. I was finished. And all my mates just ducked. They left because they didn't want to be around when there was going to be trouble, you know. And there I am, like, trying to get up out of the bed. And then the next thing I remember is this guy tapping me on the shoulder, dressed in his full uniform on Sunday morning, tapping me on the shoulder, and it was Schlenter. And he said, don't worry, Lyons, you just go back to sleep. I'll do your shift. And off he went. Did my seven-hour shift, and I bubble us in bed all of Sunday. And when he came back from duty, you know what he said to me? You know what he said to me? Nothing. He never said, you owe me. He never said, yeah, you see. He never said anything. And I never thanked him. But I tell you, what he did was like a knife in my heart. How could he be so kind to me after how I treated him? And that stuck with me. And then, just a couple of years later, when I met Sandra and we were sitting in church, and for the first time, I'm hearing somebody preach the gospel and telling me about this guy, Jesus, and I'm thinking to myself, I know that guy. I've met that guy. I know that kind of kindness to the unkind. Though he never said a word to me about Jesus, he certainly showed it. And I'm here today because of him. And I don't even know where he is because I don't think he's on Facebook and I can't find him. But such is the power, my friends, of godliness in the face of ungodliness. And it does glorify God because some will come to Christ and others will be saved.